was almost like April before. Yes. I so think that we're yeah, yeah, for us to pick up as we were like ending the last portion. Yeah. We have some questions too, but like I just talking to Wes, there's like so many things that I want to know, but like the reality of like the scope of everything, like I didn't even realize the exact timeline. I mean, even in public school, like it's so glossed over. One thing that I realized too is like I didn't realize that like there were more camps in Auschwitz. I didn't realize that Auschwitz was so massive, it was like a town. I also didn't realize um, like the erasure of queer culture. I also didn't realize that Nazi Germany like came into power like with Hitler like over the course of like almost a decade. You know, to me, like, it, you know, growing up, it just seems like it just happened overnight. And so you think, like, well, why did people run? Why did they flee? Like, what happened? Yes. Like, why were people why helping them? Like, I just don't understand. But also, like, it, it, you know, it happened so over such a progression. And it just also, like, I think what's been hard for me to process lately is that it, I feel like just in my personal experience, I'm like, through my narrative in my eyes or whatever, like, there were so many things that happened through Trump's administration that, from what I've been learning, just seemed to kind of mimic and mirror these things. And so, mm -hmm. like, it's, even it's, the coffee. It's, you know, just like even the erasure of trying to get rid of, like, um, you know, marriage equality and, you know, being in the military and things that, like, I feel like we kind of take for granted. And so, like, me thinking back the past five years and through all of those things, it's like, I was, I'm now, I can, like, not only have I seen myself in some of these people's shoes, but I'm like, I, like, I'm, I'm there. Like, I just, I'm not paying attention. And, like, what happens, what would have happened if there was another administration in the next, like, Four years of Trump's like what I have woken up one day and like, well, no, so something like, knocking on your door. door yeah, like it just like in my head, it's like, what do you mean? Like, how yeah. is this real? I think a good place to start with a lot of these questions is sort of how did Hitler get in power? Mm -hmm. What did life look like before we get to that moment? Yes. Yeah. And one thing that people always, always gloss over is the Weimar Republic. We like to think about like, boom, Hitler came to power because Treaty of Versailles, things were bad in Germany. You know, after World War One, everything was terrible. What we forget is there was a real, we call it the Golden Age of Weimar, from 23 to 29, <coughs> where Germany and Berlin and Weimar were like the center of culture and science and art, um, and especially in the bigger cities like Berlin, Hamburg, uh, places like that, there was a real flowering of queer culture. And we don't think about the Weimar Republic being the most liberal democratic government the world has ever seen to that point. Um, they expand the voting rights to everybody. They expand universal education. Um, they raise the standard of living for people. They, erase, they get rid of censorship. <coughs> and there is a big discussion about getting rid of what was paragraph 175, um, but because of various political reasons, they just couldn't basically get the votes. But there was a big discussion during the Weimar period and if you look at photos or movies from this period at Weimar, you see all of this like exciting work culture. You see um, newspapers, like there were lesbian newspapers, gay newspapers, you could just buy them on the street. Wow. Um, hundreds of clubs throughout the world that were dedicated to all different types, right? So it wasn't just like a gay club. There were many of them. There were societies, there were clubs. It was really an interesting period. And there was the um, Magnus Hirschfeld's Institute for Sexual Research, which mm -hmm. was trying to put forward this idea um, that sexuality was inborn and it wasn't something that was perverse or wrong. And so they were he was really pushing, he was one of the big pushers to 175, even before the Nazis did anything with it. What happened to that information? Like, it's not like he had the research. Yeah. He, yeah. Didn't he, yeah. didn't he flee the country for a little bit? They destroy, I mean, the and Nazis, then, like, like, yeah, they eventually were able to come yeah. back and do anything. Like, they destroyed everything. Like, they yep. burned it, they pillaged it, they erased all of this, like, years and years of work. And then we, again, if we think about what's lost in history, it, this is one of the things about, like, the privilege of who writes history. Mm -hmm. And we get to, you know, we think, oh, well, gay rights starts in the 60s and 70s. Yep. You know, no, <laughs> it doesn't. Like, there was all of this when Germany was at the forefront of pushing for basically what we think of as gay rights. And that's at the end of World War I? Or? Yeah, at the end of World War I. Um, because there was just, you know, there was this new sense of possibility, with this new government, um, and people were being experimental and throwing off these old norms. Now that doesn't mean that like everybody in Weimar was like super on board with it, they weren't. Yeah. Um, and we also, and this is where it harkens to our own time too, there was a real divide between Berlin and the urban centers and more rural areas. So in Berlin, they were, you know, it was all about modern and 
new and inclusive, inclusive, progressive, progressive all that stuff. And then there were people in, in you know, the rural areas that were not on board with that. Um, just very much like the American culture now. Like, if you go to the city, <laughs> it's urban. It's like everybody seems so uh, immersed in like different cultures and that melding pot and you go to the rural areas and it's all like typically like white individuals who don't like a black person moving in or a Hispanic individual being in their community they don't, they're like, or especially no queer yeah. mm -hmm. and you think about you know one thing that people always talk about with fine art is so much change um, in terms of more people are voting women are going to work women are going to university and they're going and they're doing all kinds of majors science law there were more women in politics in Germany, um, it was like three, six times more likely to be a woman in politics in Germany this time than you would be in the US. So, one thing that not to be wrong on is a return to traditional values. So, that fear. Home, yeah, that fear, exactly. And it sounds very like our political systems now, they build on fear to. And they didn't have any traction for a long time because during this golden age, things were good. So, the Nazi Party and the End of the twenties, before the stock market, our stock market crashes in twenty nine. They only have ten percent of the vote, and they get maybe eighteen percent of the vote. They're not. They don't get traction until our economy crashes, and we had lent Germany much money. So then Germany's economy crashes, and then people get scared again, and then now it creates a foothold for extremists. Hitler did run on the platform of making Germany great again. So mm -hmm. even those like I mean I'm not so, so, so um, I, I can't make it up, right? like so, so. <laughs> I can't make it I'm not even being like oh this is it's, it's, it's yeah. actually the same it's actually the same I think it's really important you know George has spoken about history not repeating itself and that you know the importance of this ex exhibition is about reminding people like what happened and honoring that memory about you know we're not going to let this happen again and here we have individuals in present day using that same terminology, that same fear ideology to instill laws that codify hate and that group people together to segregate and isolate individuals. And it makes us think too about you know radiations of trauma and oppression. And sometimes when we think about the Holocaust, we only think about the, the ending part, the genocide, because that is, in fact, what defines it and makes it different. But it didn't happen overnight, right? There's all of these like legal things yes. that go into place, and a lot of other people that got caught up in those legal restrictions. And that's something, too, when we think about what's lost in terms of queer culture at this time. We don't think about, you know, think all of this flourishing culture that happened, all these people who had lives and connections and then once the Nazis make it clear that they want to break down that those lives are disrupted, those communities are destroyed. Mm -hmm. And people are then forced to like think of all the gay women who then you know enter heterosexual marriages that they didn't want to be a part of. Is that the same sort of trauma that's being in a concentration camp? No, but it's not nothing, right? So we don't yes. need to be compared in suffering. We do need to think about all of these different types of stories um, that come into during this time. And in connection with our own period, um, it's really easy living in a modern period to think, oh, you know, rights want, you know, marriage equality, check it. But then you look at what happened in Germany, and you think these people had, you know, they thought they were on the cusp of all of this great stuff too. Yeah. And so that was all just yeah, away. The lesson is, like, just because you want rights doesn't mean you're in the period. You have to protect them. You have to maintain them. You have to maintain them. Yeah. Just because we got marriage equality, it doesn't stop there. You have to keep expanding that definition. And it doesn't mean that it's guaranteed forever, right? I mean, the, the lesson of Flymar is that you have to protect what you, the advancements that you've made, because they can be taken away. And I think that's what we saw in the last administration, was this, like, especially if there had been another term, what could have, what, what could have we lost? I think we get very comfortable in, you know, modern societies as well. You know, we're just this progression forward. Mm -hmm. Weimar teaches us that that isn't the case. We can very easily slide back if we don't <coughs> very, you know, proactively protect yeah. our rights, our institutions. We were um, watching a documentary over uh, paragraph 175, and in that conversation, they talk about how Hitler's rise to power, you know, the belief that everybody supported him that they really only had like 30 percent of government who was in favor of it but because of that 30 percent they were a what well, i would say like a white voting bloc and 
you know, they had to get other individuals on board with that to realize that if you want to pass a law, well, we have to be a part of that. And that's how they gain legitimacy. And we see that right now in our own politics of being able to pass laws. We have individuals who are blocking them and saying, even though they're a minority group, that they have the power in deciding what moves forward. Well, I think it reminds us, too, that, you know, right, the, the largest percentage of the national vote the Nazis ever get is 37%. And we often think, oh, landslide, everyone's for them, 37% very quickly after they're in power. So yeah, they would have had to govern as a minority party making deals, but quickly after they're in power, um, Hitler does some things which basically gives him control of the government. There's never another free election after 1932. So they start to change, and then they start to change the so laws. It's like they rewrote how voting laws were, that like we see happening right now in America with 40 <laughs> different states who are issuing new voting restrictions that limit the ability of Americans to vote. Or within our own community. Within our own community. Another, <laughs> another organization, you know, the we, you know, Kansas City Diversity Coalition, who actively mobilized a group of individuals to vote on their bylaws so that they can strip the ability of the community to elect their leadership and to hold the organization accountable for what they do with public funds. So we see that, you know, down know. the local small scale and also on this macro scale like in our big government as well. And I think it's important to think about those small steps, right? We don't have to like compare like is now the Holocaust? No. no. Think no. about those steps. Think about who you vote for is important and also paying attention to, you know, the the spine print in laws that are put forward. And I think that's where people often check out of the little stuff and they only pay attention to the top level and sometimes it's it's almost too late. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's too late and that's what we saw with Nazi Germany. Before, before people, once people realized that this was bad, it was too late. Yeah, so it's a, again, there is this sort of progression period, and we have to always think about the persecution of homosexual victims in this larger picture of or creating this racial community. So the Nazis are super focused on race, and that's why the Jews come in, that's why, um, you know, Roma. The Roma come in. So there's, they're, they're focused on creating this racial community and removing individuals who don't fit that those parameters, mm -hmm. or we threaten those parameters, which was the case of um, their looking at gay men. So you might have expected in the early years, you know, Hitler comes to power in 33, in those early years, you know, persecution is kind of haphazard. There isn't a, you know, a, it's very at the local level, it's not really straight from the top. You see local police starting to raid gay clubs in a different way, because even though paragraph 175 has been on the books all these years, they're mostly not enforcing it. So, um, yeah. but it's also like a little bit of like, you know, that speaks to like us not going to a little level and like getting that from out of kind of way and just abolish before they were able to take that and yeah. create what and, they created. And people aren't paying attention when it's a few hundred people, right? So yes. in 1934, before they changed the law, there's it's not me. It's not me, but there's only like a few hundred people who were convicted under paragraph 175. Once the Nazis rewrite it, that goes up um, to about like 5,000. And then eventually in the 38, the highest number that they'll convict in one year is almost, it's just over 8,000. Under paragraph 175, is that what you're speaking mm -hmm. to? And that's just that. That's, yes. Over the course of the Nazi period, there's about 100,000 cases of people being um, arrested or denounced, well, arrested for some sort of homosexual activity. Mm -hmm. About 50,000 of them were convicted. And about ten to fifteen thousand end up in camps. Many others wound up in prison, where they serve a specific prison sentence. And if they repeat offenders, they will more likely to be sent to a camp. But mostly, um, a Dachau, Buchenwald, Sachsenhausen. Few of them end up in Auschwitz. Some of them do, um, and some people are sort of double victimized. They might be Jewish and gay. I was wondering how that played out for Jewish individuals who were identified as gay. For the most part, it's they're going to be persecuted as Jewish. Okay. And another thing to point out is the Nazis didn't care if you identified as gay. They cared if you did something. So it was about behavior, not an identity. The, I had uh, I read that you know Hitler like if they were going to convict somebody who was a political figure or an entertainer, that he had the final say of whether or not that individual was prosecuted under paragraph one seventy five. There's always exceptions to it. I don't know that he's specifically caring that much about individuals. Yeah, no, I thought that was the, the way they yeah. worded that. I thought that was it. I was like, was like that he cared about? Like, yeah. 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 Oh, was it wasn't like 
like in this right manner as general or something, was but we can't identify as yeah. So, yeah, there were, there's always a, a right hand <laughs> to <laughs> those individuals in power. And we've seen throughout US history, you know, with Martin Luther King, like his right hand man, Byron Rustin, was gay. And you see JFK had JFK had, had really like, close. No, I think you're talking about Ernest Strong. Yes. Who was, yes. That's how it's taken. Yes. And he, you know, in those, it also speaks to the early days of how the Nazis approached this. Like, they weren't for it, but they hadn't settled on a policy that they were going to go after. Mm-hmm. But then in 34, they had been killed. Um, and partially that's a power structure within the Nazi party. And they used his homosexuality as a thing to then vilify other homosexuals. As an example. As an example. But it was mostly a power struggle, and then it worked out in a PR way for them. Wow. Yeah, PR way, I think that's critical years that they turned it into a marketing. Mm-hmm. It's also like you just said, it's a power struggle. This whole thing was just a power struggle. Yeah. So there's lots of, I don't know, there's lots of ways that we can see parallels. Um, and then also, when we think about, to me, I always like to think about those early periods where the laws changed. Because mm-hmm. even something, speaking about Jewish victims, if Hitler um, is appointed as chancellor at the end of January 33, by April, there is an anti-Jewish boycott where stormtroopers stand in front of Jewish stores and say, like, you can't shop here. It's supposed to last a couple of weeks. It only lasts a couple of days because the Germans are like, well, this is highly inconvenient and also seems a little illegal. Right, so, like, I just need to go in there and get some Yeah, like, this, like, is, where I I got, shop? Yeah, this <laughs> is where I got my socks. I don't want to go to that store. Like, my socks are here. And so the, the German people were just, like, not into it. And they thought it seemed a little illegal. So what do they do? They pass laws. You start passing laws. You start increasing propaganda. Um, like limiting the ability for Jewish individuals to have a business. That comes later. Okay. Yeah, that comes later. But definitely they, they will do that. Um, but even passing laws that also in April that start to, you know, after the failed point about then they, they start passing laws about separating Jews um, out of social clubs. So you can't be Jewish and be in, um, like, maybe every day after school you play, or after work you like play. The boys and girls Yeah, or you play soccer with your Jewish neighbor. But now you can't because the soccer club is, you know, there are no Jews allowed. So it makes it easier for people to believe propaganda when there's no everyday thing to bump up against it. But you see lots of laws happen in those early years, 33 to 35, and then 35, the same year as 175, that's when they do more work, and then they really start to separate out society. But by now, people are sort of adjusting to it, and then post Nuremberg, you see all these signs go up all over Germany that say the Jews are not wanted here, the Jews are our misfortune. Think back just a few years when people were uncomfortable with boycott. So it shows and now they're fully embracing it. They're embracing it when they're not objecting. And at the end of the day, the Nazi regime doesn't need you to buy in. They just need you to not care. Yeah. I think that you know that speaks to silence equals violence. Mm-hmm. Like silence yep. equals death. And if you think about, you know, why didn't more people step up? Whether yeah. it be to like protect Jews, to protect anyone of these other victim groups, to protect, you know, their gay neighbors. In some cases, in many cases, it's self-interest. Mm-hmm. What's better for me? It isn't self-preservation. It's self-interest. Well, you know, it's a little bit better for me to not say anything. Or I never really liked this guy. And if he's taken away. I want to leave his house. Or, wow. Um, there's a good, wow. there's an interesting story. Of, yeah, because something had to happen to their property, their belongings, their businesses. Like they can buy it, they can take it. Or um, there's lots of these. The hate always factors, but it's so often in the Holocaust you have these small reasons, these little. What's better for me? I want that. Some people are very ideologically motivated. Mm-hmm. Many people just want stuff for themselves. Yeah. Which I think is disappointing. When we think about human nature, I think we'd almost rather it be like, oh, if someone is really ideologically into this. That's my thought was that it was an ideological thing, that people bought into it, but it was more of a sort of way more shallower than that. There are also instances where people like, you know, turned on them, like not even just in Germany, but other countries where, you know, Nazis weren't sent in full force, but people in other countries were sending Jews and other to a whole other country to Auschwitz to concentration camps. You know, like watch documentaries where this that's I think that's what really got me so much is that they were like literally like before they came knocking on the door, they were before like park and trials like hanging out and as we were being called away, people were like we're so glad we're leaving, like, you know, drawing stuff, throwing stuff at us, and it's like, 
it made me realize, like, thinking of my life, like, how, oh, like, privilege and stuff that we are, like, if something like that would happen, like, which one of my neighbors would turn on me? Yeah. Who around me that I am with right now that I see at a grocery store every day or a, a convenience store would turn on me and, like, you know, throw things at me and say these things? And I'm like, that's, because I'm sure that they never, they, literally the day before, they were, like, thought that they were friends. They thought that... You could trust them. Yes. Mm-hmm. That they knew you, that that would make a difference. Yeah. Well, there's lots of other, right? There's the actual, like, turning on someone and throwing things, there's the turning away, mm-hmm. not saying something, there's the turning in. You know, that's, mm-hmm. I think, whether you're speaking about the countries, or you're speaking about the victims within Germany, you know, the Nazis couldn't be everywhere. They relied yeah. on local collaborators, be it outside of the you know, Germany proper or within, and especially with the victims, you see a lot of, like, denunciations for the way that they caught so many people. Same thing when they were looking to, like, euthanize and sterilize people. That they considered to be not racially pure or detrimental mm-hmm. to the you know, racial health, they mostly just relied on other people saying, you know, calling them up, sending in a letter, you know, this lady doesn't seem very bright, doesn't seem like it's good genetic material. And in some cases, wow. these people who would be put before a panel to be sterilized, they never saw the doctors at all. They would just have to fill out a form, and then a group of men, always male doctors, would decide whether this person would be sterilized or not. Wow. When we're, we're talking about that sterilization and you know, that leads to medical experimentation, there there was a camp that was specifically experimented on homosexuals. Yeah, I can't, it starts with the B. Buchenwald did Buchenwald. have some um, forced castration <coughs> experiments that happened. There's a lot of different locations have different types of medical experiments that they do. Some are more wartime. Some are many of them are focused in either sterilization or reproductive ways if they're not focused on war efforts. Movement one was one that had um, experimentation with castration. And that's another part of, you know, men who were convicted of homosexuality could either be sent to prison, a camp later, or some of them could be released from prison if they would agree to castration. But if we think about it, that's not unique to Germany, right? No. If you look at, I mean, I'm more familiar with Europe because I'm a European historian, but even in the post war period in Britain, this is something that men are being sentenced to if they're caught engaging with another man, chemical castration. So that's something that is around the West, isn't just specific to Nazi Germany, and it doesn't end. Yeah, so it, like, why would you do that? Like, the person is, they're not procreating, so why are you castrating? Uh, well, I think control. they control, and they want control. them to not persuade other men, and also to not persuade other men. To like, they're, uh, they're looking to like, kill their sex drive and punish them and not go after other men. Because they've been drinking more, you know, again, pulling men away from this reproductive. Saying that, yeah, and also saying that people choose homosexuality. Well, like saying that, like I can, and yeah, list, yeah. like you're it it goes, it's like I can create more games. Yes. That feeling yeah. of, um, you know, and I think of it this way for those individuals who push back, you know, and say being around gay people makes people gay, you know, and stuff like that. Like, though they have internalized homophobia because they, in some capacity, are attracted or see something beneficial in the, in the same sex. And so they have to squash that. They can't allow that to be a part of who they probably identify. And so they latch on to these opportunities to discriminate and oppress and magnify that so that they don't get identified with those feelings that they have. Sure. I just think it's so interesting too that like, you know, all these, I don't know, but Hitler's like writing dude for a while was queer and like nobody was like, you guys hang out a lot and you're like, you're having meetings, like, are you gay Hitler? Like, any, People coming for him, you know what I mean? Like it just gets There is a lot of um, there's some scholarship that's been written about a lot of the homoerotic imagery of Nazi Germany because of so much of their like look at the propaganda. Over masculine and like they yeah. are so yeah. obsessed early. with the male well, Yeah, I mean it's very like Tom Finn and like yes. Yeah. Yeah. And they were like really into the Greeks and making like Greek <clears throat> standards of beauty to <clears throat> their own. But if you look at it there's <clears throat> the, and there are some interesting um, scholars out there working on talking about yeah, more eroticism of Nazi um, art and that. So it's kind of interesting to think about it in those terms. So you talk about individuals who agree to like castration or something like that to be released back to society. What was life like for individuals that who, you know, were released back to society? Well, two things, like you said too, like I think it's important to note that um, although like if you were homosexual and you were released that um, Paragraph 175 still wasn't changed for yep. years. After. 1994. 1994 is when that law was revoked. 
They stopped enforcing it in the late 1960s, but it remained, yeah, absolutely. That's on still the still a very yeah, long period of time. 67, so, even East Germany, after, 68, after going through something more like horrific and traumatic and everything, and then you're released back, like, you know, we talked about the erasure of, like, even the pink triangles and all those probably, like, all of these things that identify them because you could still be re-persecuted and not be under that fear and that trauma. And you, like, this yeah. could happen again. I'm not dying. And you couldn't apply for any sort of restitution or aid or until, I think it was 2002 or four, the German state rectified that. Do you know what that looked like for, like, um, like, like leaving your country in asylum? Because, I mean, we're talking about Germany, but there were, like, I mean, if you were pulled from, you know, another country, like Spain or France, like, would you want to go back when your neighbors, like, literally decided? Well, like, they only persecute, persecuted gay victims in Germany. Okay. So they were not, or within the German, like Austria, marginally mm-hmm. Czech areas, because they didn't care about it, because it was about racial, they're building their own there's community. The purity of the so German these race. French guys can have all the sex they want with each other, because that doesn't, they don't, the fewer French people for them to deal with, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, it's it's that basic. It's like, we don't care about their sexual, and that's why it's not a moral issue, it's not a religious issue, it's about a racial community. So they do not go after them in any other countries. It's just, it's just the German Within their own. Which I think is interesting and so different from what we think when we look at intolerance in our own society. Because it's so, you know, Yeah. Because it's based on this like religious morality issue, not in something else. I think, yeah, I think every, every, well, every other country said that too. You look at the other countries in the Middle East. Like Saudi Arabia. Arabia. Exactly. Yeah, yeah it's about, because it's about a religious thing. It's about a religious, yeah. about a religious thing. But your your question about what did it look like for these people who were released? Mm-hmm. What's interesting is you see once the so thirty eight is the height of um, convictions under paragraph one seventy five. What why thirty eight? Because in thirty nine war starts. What does Germany need? Men. men. They always need men, and they they never have enough. So they kind of dial back on their rounding up the homosexuals because these are young men who can fight. So some men, even if they serve prison sentence sentences were put back into the military, um, and they would be marked and sometimes mistreated, but they mostly, they're living relatively normal lives, but they could still be, that identity still could fall them, and then that would be difficult. But they do kind of, the war aimed, and you see this in a number of ways, Germany's willing to like, fudge on its ideology mm-hmm. because of what they need for the war. They do the same thing with women, they're like, women need to be in the home, but like, guess what, not enough people, they, ladies gotta go to work. Right? Yeah. Those were like the... An unplanned like women's revolution into the workforce that like we had here in America, but the yeah. war effort as well. It's exactly they did the same thing. Yeah. And one thing that like you know my own specific research deals with um, Nazi women guards in the concentration camps, huh. and they're really interesting because they're very much doing a man's job, and they're really this like their male colleagues don't like them. They think that it lessens their position. There. It's like women because military. women are doing the same thing they're doing. Yeah, and they think, it, they think it lessens them, and they're like. Well, I was drafted for this. I'm not trying to break a glass ceiling. I'm just here. So yeah. it's really interesting to see those gender tensions play out among perpetrators, which is something we don't generally think about. When the ally always come through. So there's this feeling of hope when you see them like break through the gates, you know, of uh, the concentration camp. So like free individuals. But there are people that were maintained in those spaces were homosexuals. Like Well, we have to nuance that a little bit. So yeah. for the most part People who, if if, they, if homosexuals wound up in the camps, like the Saxon House and the Buchenwald, the Americans are just liberating these places. So they would have been, if they were there, they could have just been liberated and out. It also was really easy to change your identity, like why right, you're there, just take it out, yeah. right? You know, yep. that's fine. Where you do see people either reincarcerated or maintain being in prison is when those individuals were sent to prisons rather than camps. Uh, so in that way, you would actually be a little bit better off in terms of liberation if you had been sent to a camp than if you had been just in prison because that's where they would look at it and they kept 175 in the books and that didn't necessarily open up all the prisons because they were seen as more legitimate incarceration. Right, yeah, because they had codified that hate into law so those individuals are, they have broken the law. So. Well, and they're looking, they're just looking at prisons and thinking like, well, maybe people right, are there still murdering. Yeah, exactly. Murdered, there was lots of other even though they were murdering too. Yes, yeah. but I think when the allies come in, that's something they just, oh, well, these people can stay in prison. So it was, it was easier, that sort of lack of liberation happens more in a prison space than mm-hmm. in a camp space. 
But that, you know, again, doesn't change the fact that even those people who were liberated, what happens to them afterwards? And that they are going to just be silent about their experience for many years. And you both mentioned this issue of East Germany and West Germany. East Germany, interestingly, reverts back to the old Prussian code, which makes sense in the East. But yeah. they go back to the original sort of more narrow definition, and mostly for that 20-year period after the war, they, they really don't enforce it. They're not interested in persecution. Happens occasionally, but it's not a program. Now in the West, they keep the Nazi version, and they do more aggressively go after gay men. So again, during that 20-year mm -hmm. period, there's about 100,000 people that are caught up in that, or we have 100,000 cases. And that's the same for the Nazi period. We say 100,000 you know, denunciations, 50,000 convictions. Those numbers are a little bit difficult because some people were convicted more than once. So we don't have accurate information. That's the thing that's so frustrating you know, as historians of this period. We just don't have the, the data and the resources are lacking because it was such a hidden history. And I mean, it's not like the Nazis wanted people to know what they were doing either. So I'm sure a lot of that information was just well, they kept, destroyed. Yes, they kept good documents, then they destroyed some of it. Um, but they just, from the from the victim side of it, we just don't we just don't know. There's, you know, that makes me think of um, like shame of identifying as a homosexual, or that you were in prison or the camps for that uh, identification, and so you don't go back home and talk about. It. Mm -hmm. You don't engage back in your community and talk about what happened, and so there's a complete silencing and erasure, like a personal, mm -hmm. on that level, just because of the shame of what took place. I just feel mm -hmm. like I've done that, just like, full guilt. Guilt of like not doing things before all this happened, or not, you know, like, and that I, I don't know, I feel like I would have that shame, but also that guilt that maybe like, I, I let this happen to me, like, how could I have not run, how could I have not helped the people, how could I have not done all these things, and I think like, even now as queer people, I think that sometimes like, I even feel sometimes that I, I don't do enough, or I mm -hmm. should be more present, or I should be going to do more things, or I should, you know what I mean? Like you still have that built in that shame. I think that's why it's really important for when people say, stand up. You have to do whatever's within your capacity to like mm -hmm. spread that message, make sure people are aware of what's taking place. So I think that's, you know, that speaks to that. Like, what are you doing? And not holding people account, you know, in a saying like, you didn't go to that protest, so you're not a supporter. It's like, there are other ways to offer that support that silence is the problem. And even small things like calling people on their language, you know, when you know, people refer to something as gay in a derogatory way. Yeah. It, it happens, I think, less than it used to, but it still does. And just like being able to say, like, stop that, because when you, when that enters, you know, when that stays as a okay thing to say, it just, it changes the way people think. And so I think it's these little actions, like, I mean, I say this all the time with this Nazi period, it's the little stuff. The little and so many actions, you know, even something during Nazi times as giving the, the Hitler salute, signing your letters, Hitler, Hitler, all these tiny actions of compliance matter. Yeah. Those um, brainwashing. That's all those little tiny things of non action, like they matter. Yeah. The well, inaction. Yeah, the the inaction in exactly. Matters. The inaction is really how the Holocaust happens. But I, I want to be careful about the word brainwashing because I think that lets people off the hook. Ah, and yeah, that's a really good point. So Thank if you, you, yeah. yeah, if you think about like Nazi propaganda, there was a lot of it, right? But we don't want to talk about it in terms of brainwashing because this is a really educated, literate society, and those people made choices about the information that they consumed mm -hmm. and what they did with it. And I think that is a long-lasting message for us. We it's always comes yeah. down to a choice. And we're an educated, literate society, and we have the responsibility to check what we read and. To, to hold others accountable. And hold others accountable. So it's it's really I see lots of parallels in terms of, you know, propaganda and just how people will consume what fits their worldview rather than being critical figures. So you would think, you know, here we are in the, uh, the digital age where there isn't a divide anymore. You can find your group like that. Mm -hmm. So that all of that ability to create or in, I would say to promote a narrative that maybe wouldn't have been shared otherwise, or would have died out, it doesn't happen now. Like you are able to find somebody on the other side of the world who supports you, and you can find somebody else, and you can sort of build up this false narrative of what is taking place. Exactly, and then it can it can grow and spread, and pretty soon nobody's checking what they really believe. And so you have this space of people who were caught up in that, and then you have people who are just trying to live their everyday lives. Yeah, I think that's the. 
like that weird contrast of, you know, people living their everyday lives of going to school, shopping, having parties, you know, weddings and funerals, you know, these things that, you know, we see taking place behind us right now. And there's, while that's happening, there's also people being put in cattle bars and shipped off to death camps. And we think about what does this translate to our own time? You know, we watched aggressive family separation policies mm. and how, like, I didn't go down to the border. I'm assuming you both didn't either, right? So no. it's like one of those things like we have more information now than people ever did. And yet, what does that mean for our own actions? Right. And I think it's it's scary because it. what is our responsibility? The propensity for it to happen again is easier, maybe? Yeah. Or, and, I like, th- and I think sometimes closer than we realize. Exactly. Closer than we realize. Yes. I think yes. that's, yeah, that's a better way. And it doesn't have to be, you know, never again. Well, no, never again. It's not going to look like this. Yeah, it'll but, it'll take a different shape. I mean, it yes. takes the shape of kids in cages. Yes, and yes. it takes like the shape. It's taking shape all the time. And gen- yeah, genocide continues to happen. Or being, banning transgender individuals well, using a certain restroom. Being marginalized group of, yes. you know, yeah. um, trans women of color that are being murdered. There are even, you know, black people by the hands of our own government. Like, it's, and like, here we are, like, watching it and then be like, oh, well, do you want to go to Chick-fil-A after this? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yep. Like, and I, I think that's, you know, that you reminded me as when you said person of color that there aren't any images of people of color. Mm-hmm. Which is mostly because they're not a part of this experience in the way that you might expect it to be based on how racial this regime is. Also, okay. it's like the geography of it. Like, There's just not that many black people. There's not that many people in no. the like, like, world. There are some in Germany. Um, there was a group of kids, there was about 600 of them, that were um, the product of marriages between French um, colonial troops okay. and German women in the post war uh, World War I period. And there was, you know, a few hundred kids that were born. They then become victims of sterilization. So they're sterilized. So that's ending shelter. Yeah. Their ability to procreate. Yeah. yeah. But, there, just, but that's about the largest group, single group we can talk about, just because, as you said, geographically, it's not... It's, it's predominantly white. It's predominantly white. Yeah. yeah. I think it's very important right now to, like, I mean, I've grown... I mean, Pride Month for me this month, you know, I feel like every... Every, every day is Pride for me, every month is Pride for me. Right, every, yeah. Every time the June 1st comes around, everybody has all these questions on social media. It's like, oh, what is Pride for you? Like, what are you focused on? I think my, my big focus for me this year is just visibility and how important that is. And also, you know, like, out of everything, it's like, see something, say something, you know. Not a lot of really taught that to, like, a nation, but, like, as queer people, like, we've adopted that. I think that's really what's important, that if you see something, say something. You know, if it's somebody saying, um... Mispromoting somebody if it's somebody that's like, using derogatory terms and somebody, you know. And also, I think what if twenty twenty has not taught me anything except for this is that there is a difference between cancel culture and accountability culture. Yes, one hundred percent difference. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a yeah, really great point. Is holding yourself and other people accountable. Yes. And I think thinking about it, like it's easier for us to think about these small things in our world. Like yes, being accountable is important. I think it's much harder when we look back because we know the end of the story to all of us. We look at the end and we don't think about all of these little actions in the beginning to facilitate it. This yeah, the foundation for it. I mean, you know, I talk about like, you know, the foundation that you build your home on, the foundation you build your community on. And their foundation were those little bricks of laws that mm-hmm. it disempowered people. Mm-hmm. And little personal choices and, um, yeah, it's the little stuff. And I think it's so easy to get caught up in something that's like, Big murder, as opposed to self-interest. And you you lose um, that smaller picture when you talk about you know. Like I said, I didn't know homosexuals were part of this. I didn't even know like Roma individuals were part of the Holocaust or these other marginalized groups that were part of it. And that came from and that was something that I knew years ago. That came from our research to have this conversation. I mean, I just and I also didn't know the timeline. I didn't know the timeline. Like you said, like it did, this did not happen overnight. There yeah. was a lot of groundwork that Hitler and the Nazi regime laid way before, and a lot of it was based on make Germany great again, make things better, and they were actively, you know, helping a nation and helping the people that were, you know, impoverished and unemployed, and you know, it, it did the optics on that looked like. I think you know, thinking back then, like now, like understanding that now, I can, I can kind of understand 
some of the Republicans that were so gung ho gung ho for like what Trump was trying to do, but also as a queer person, I was able to see my perspective of like mm. you're you're feeding these people what they need to hear to get them to where you want to go, but you're still discounting a whole section of marginalized group of people to get what you want, and that's I don't know. To me, like if look, everything this past couple weeks has taught me is that like we need inclusivity, we need diversity, and able to move forward as uh, as as humans to. Be progressive to be smart to advance in technology to and to advance in like you know healthcare and like everything we need each other yeah we can't the rebel and the uniqueness of each of us yeah and and the big program of you know nazi germany was eradicating diversity i mean there really was like creating they wanted every to be German. yeah and, and yeah. a very specific definition a very specific, very specific in this you know Hi, wait, look, I this, color skin color hair color yeah. Every this whole Skamai chapter of racial yeah. community, and we can all, and that's what people miss too. When you just look at some of those propaganda posters, if you were in the in group, wow, what a time for you! Like, mm-hmm. you could go on a cruise <laughs> and free concerts and get a Volkswagen and all this like fun wow. stuff if you're in the in group. So it's really easy to be like, oh, this sounds like fun. I like people talking to me, and it's easy to forget. Well, some of these other people are, but that's not me, anyways, or it's not that bad. It's not going to happen it's to me. It's not going to happen to me. And for many people, it sure does. Yeah. So it's, I don't know, it's the thing, by the time you realize it, it's too late. So thinking about that, you know, you know, like you touched on cancel culture and accountability culture and what the difference is between that, what has Germany done since then to be that accountability <coughs> team? I'm so glad you asked that question because I think Germany has done, this is, it did not happen overnight, it took many decades, <laughs> yeah. right? I like, think that's huge <laughs> to say, like, you know, we say it didn't happen overnight for the Holocaust uh-huh. to take place, but that is still within a decade's time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it took decades to get to a point where you can be accountable. And yet, what they're doing is miles ahead of what we were doing in addressing our own racial <coughs> history. And in talking about slavery. Talking about slavery. Like, so they you, don't even want to teach it in school. No. <laughs> so, yeah, but, so let's look at what Germany does. Like, they, again, took, took a while, but now, of course, it's taught in school. Um, it's yeah. mandatory for many school kids to go to these places. You see to tour. To tour it. You see active memorialization happening. And of course, Germany has like right wing stuff still all across Europe. Does what we do too, right? So we'll see it in the comments below. Mm-hmm. I'm sure. Yes, <laughs> but definitely as a as a like their national position is talking, you know, owning up to what they did during the Third Reich. And if you look at Berlin, um, there is a many many acres memorial right outside like the heart of German government. So you can see the German government building and then right, you know, catacorner is this massive memorial to Europe's of Jews. There's not a lawmaker that goes into that building that can't see from, you know, the building this crime that was committed in living memory. And across from that memorial in the tear garden is a small memorial to homosexual victims. And so it's interesting because that one was put up in 2008 and it's this sort of, um, looks like a cement building that's kind of slanted, mm-hmm. and you look inside of it and there's a film playing. And the first film that was playing was of two men kissing. And it was really interesting because it looked as though, you would look, if you looked in the window, it looked like what you were seeing was a reflection behind you. Wow. So it was like filmed in like the same space, and so it's like you could almost like, you're just catching it. Yeah, you're catching yeah. you turn around and you're gone, right? Um, but it was, there was some debate about this more because it was two men, and that's again very, only inclusive of very specific part of this experience. So um, they agreed to change the film out every couple of years. The next one included people reacting to all different queer relationships kissing. And then I think about 2018, they switched it out again. And this one is just, um, they just have a series of people kissing while in the background you see different periods of gay history and liberation and struggles throughout time. Wow. So it's it's trying to bring it into part of this larger picture. But it's I think memorialization is so interesting and shows where people are. And like I said, I think Germany has done a good job of facing up to what it's done. Mm-hmm. It also provides a lot of money to like even places like the Auschwitz Memorial in Poland. They fund, you know, places and memorial sites like that outside of Germany. The German government funds all of the memorials that are in former campsites, there are no former, there are no memorials to former Nazis, right? It's not like no, in America. We've got, we've got, like, you know, <laughs> we have a Confederate statue, yeah. which doesn't make any sense unless no. you want to perpetuate the Confederacy. Yes. So when people 
off, I often get this question, what are we doing now? And I say, what are we doing? Right. Yes. You know. Like putting that onus back on us. We have had way more time. And yet it's still so divisive. And yeah, like you said, you can't even teach you know, critical race theory in classrooms because that's teaching people, you know, teaching kids shame. No, it's not. It's teaching them about what our history is and how you make sure it doesn't happen in Canada. And that's what I think Germany has started to do really well, separating out, like, no, you as a 10-year-old in Germany don't need to feel guilty about the Holocaust. You need to understand how the country in which you live was responsible for this thing in the past. Yeah, I think that's a, a powerful way to shape that narrative. I think that's really funny. Um, I recently just found somebody um, who was 20 years old, um, grew up a little poor, but is white. And um, we were talking the last couple of weeks, and I was like, really been watching documentaries, trying to do this. And I noticed every time I started talking, like, because he's like really interested, and then like he would get quiet, like, what's wrong? And he's like, well, like, I'm German, so it's like my family's very German, and I felt like really awkward. And I was like, why? Like, you weren't there, you didn't know this, but he's yeah. also like, I can't do these things. And I was like, that's interesting. But I would say that he grew up in America, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, yeah, how would you possibly know? We don't teach it. Mm-hmm. And I think we often see surveys, even, you know, 60% of kids don't know what Auschwitz is. Well, do 60% of kids know what Gettysburg is? Know what, no. you know, it's like, it's a general <laughs> yeah. feeling of history education. It's like lost over. Right? Yeah. So, I think... Lewis Park is a good example. Yes, of that. yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Like, why is that part there? Mm-hmm. So I think there's all sorts of, there's, there's lots of problems, but a lot it's, of it's very easy to just like pick out one thing and like, you didn't know about that, X, Y, Z, because of it, and it's just, we, there's just a lot to know, and we need to, I think, as a historian, prioritize history education, because it matters a lot to our present. Yeah, it, uh, it shapes your future. Yep. Knowing where you came from helps, this like, helps you on your path towards the future. And it, you know, they always say, oh, history, you know, if you don't know it, it so I think about it in terms of human nature problems. So when I look at the Holocaust, I think, hey, where are there were any other there's hate and intolerance and cruelty? What about our human nature led us to this? Where are the I mean, the chinks of our human nature? Where, where are the flaws? What do we need to be aware of so we don't do it again? We're very susceptible to in group, out group. Mm-hmm. We constantly Exclusion of your, yes. no fans, no fans. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a it's a Something about us wants to do that, and we have to fight back against it. Like fear, fear, um, like uh, capitalism. Those are two major things that keep people at bay with other things. I mean, that's like that's like the whole premise of our show is to like normalize things, things that like our society may deem as taboo, things that we have not been fully educated on, like whatever, and just like normalizing those conversations and doing it like at such a young age where you don't grow up. I think like. Uh, I was talking to him even about oh because I went to Lewis Park yesterday and it was like one million degrees yeah. you know they're like these, <laughs> they're so happy in summer yeah there was just like some people you know that were like um, obviously different religions that were like more covered up and I'm just like they must be dying and so were their kids but also I mean part of like even our culture thinking about like how we display ourselves like at the pool as opposed to mm-hmm. European countries where they're like in more skin be or new beaches and like how just like that shape of that body like growing yeah. up isn't mm-hmm. even but you can't even like um, you can't even talk about body parts. You know, it's the flower. It's you know <laughs> you right. don't actually right. call it a vagina. Mm-hmm. You know, it's sort of like you're already creating that that like, shame, that, that shame, yeah. uh, you know, that structure of yeah. like taboo. That even if you were a little bit more open, that like I couldn't discuss it with my neighbor or my friend because mm-hmm. like our mm-hmm. society as like, a whole just doesn't accept that. Mm-hmm. But I mean, that's a huge part of our educational system too. Like to even normalize these conversations that. No. It erases those, uh, the shame, those barriers that keep you from knowing the other person. And I think we're also really afraid of being uncomfortable. And, you know, in one of the classes that I teach, we talk a lot about, you know, especially when it gets to issues of race. It's like, mm-hmm. it's okay to be uncomfortable. You should be. You should be. Yeah. It's not, and it's, it's not anyone's job to make you feel comfortable. But I think we feel like, oh, I'm not uncomfortable, I should avoid this. But sometimes you need to be in the space and uncomfortable. To move forward, and I that's how you grow. Yeah, yeah, we don't push each other. People don't realize that to like a basic level because you know, like unboxes is like really fun. So we started a kickball team, and I feel like there was a lot of uncomfort level of me, you know, as number one, it's not a body that runs, but also like somebody that's like forty years old and like hasn't played sports and like broken bones and like. But that uncomfortableness, like you know, you have to walk through it sometimes. You just have to power through. You have to ask questions like, "Hey, look, 
I don't know the rules. I don't know what bases are. Like this is, I feel really embarrassed and uncomfortable. But you know, our team of us, like it, it's a fight. We're all we'll all learn together. And that, I think the beautiful thing about leaning into that uncomfortableness mm -hmm. is who you meet in that process, mm -hmm. and what you learn about yourself, and what you learn about those other individuals. It just yeah. strengthens your community. And learning to listen to the experience of others as well. And I think that's something we struggle with too. It's like we often. Of course, we want to tell our stories, and that's important. But then I think, conversely, we're not always good about listening to the experiences of others. And it seems like such a simple thing, right? But it's like something you have to practice. It's like muscle memory. Mm. And I watched, you know, I watched some of my students do this. It's like you just have to like ah, pull back, put your hand down, and let this other person talk. Right? Yeah. It's being comfortable listening to that other person. It's not about waiting for your response. I mean, yes. Because sometimes in our conversations, it's like, oh, I want to say this, but I'm like. I need to listen to what you're saying, yeah. and I'll have to come back to my thoughts <laughs> at a different point in time. Yeah, yeah. and then I mean, like, I'll, like our segments are always so different too. So sometimes, like even today, I feel like it might got in my head for a little bit. It's like, am I not saying enough? And am I whatever? But like right now is the time. Like I just, I'm learning a lot of things. I'm like, I'm, I don't ever met anybody in academia that has your knowledge, and I'm like processing. I'm like, this is so. I feel so. I don't know, like emotional being here, but like also a big part of it is like I feel like everyone's so privileged to be able to meet you and sit here and listen to everything you have to say. I think this is incredible. And like, there's so many people that I know that don't get the opportunities that we like, sometimes get. And like, I'm yeah. so appreciative. Yeah. Well, I'm very appreciative to, to be here and able to have this discussion because certainly, you know, we want to be able to talk to a larger audience and to highlight the experiences of other victims of the Holocaust. Um, and we're also, you know, part of our mission is about applying the lessons of the past to create a more um, you know, tolerant, safer world. And it's it's important to do that. And I think if we don't move it into the present, we're just in like the commemoration business. And you know, I, you know, how does that help? How does that help, right? So, you know, as wrapping this seg this segment up, you know, we have the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education, so we have something here local that you know can continue that narrative, can continue that conversation. How can people engage with your organization, and what what do y'all do? So we are an organization that's based in Albany Park, and we do uh, speaker series. We have all sorts of programming for adults, we have teachers. One thing that I'm really excited about coming up in the fall is we have a speaker who is going to specifically address the experience of people thinking to the Holocaust. Um, and then we have the, the same what is that? It's in October um, to coincide with the lecture coming out there. Nice. So is that in person, virtual? It's on Zoom, okay. so anyone can access it free. Great. It's on Zoom. And then the same man is going to be a part of a panel on other victims. So it's interesting to hear not just a more in depth view, similar to like, you know, what I've talked about, but even more. And then he'll also talk about like just supposing policy. So mm. what, what does this look like comparatively in terms of like people who were caught up in the euthanasia program, people who were caught up um, the Roma experience? How does that compare to the Jewish one? So it's nice for people to see all of these things together. So I'm really excited to bring programming like that to a broad audience. Yes. Um, and continuing that story. Yes, exactly. Continuing that story. So we do we do a lot of work with that. Awesome. Well. Thank you for this opportunity yeah, and awesome. joining us and, uh, and helping you know educate us and our viewers about the Holocaust and the impact it had on society as a whole. Thank you so much. Thank you.